Good afternoon and welcome to City Club of Portland Friday Forum. City Club is where we bring civic-minded people together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm Karen Kirvin, president of City Club, and I would like to welcome members and guests alike, those of you who join us today at Sentinel Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures that we put on the state's best programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partner, Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are Bank of the Cascades, Family Care Health Plans, Legacy Health, Russell Fellow Properties, The Standard, and Stoll Reeves. We are grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of them. In April and May, we are hosting several events focused on arts and culture. Oregon Ballet Theater's artistic director and executive director will talk about OBT's new vision for community engagement. Our April 14th Civic Drinks at The Good Foot will bring together arts organizations, nonprofits, and businesses for a night of networking. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, we will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. After our program, Jackie Sandmeyer will facilitate a Q&A session with our panelists. Members, please come to the microphone to ask your question. For all of our audience members, please locate the index cards on the center of your tables and write your questions on them during the forum. Hold your cards up high and City Club staff will collect them prior to the start of Q&A. We are pleased to welcome City Club member and Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici to the City Club audience today. <laughs> Congresswoman Bonamici has recently begun, begun an inquiry with the U.S. Department of Education about the privacy of students' medical records. She will speak briefly about this work at the end of the program and will ask the first question at the microphone. And now for today's program. Three players were dismissed from the University of Oregon basketball team for allegedly gang ra raping a female student, an incident their coach knew of before allowing them to play in tournament games that added a $50,000 bonus to his salary. Months later, a nurse went public to detail years of trauma following a similar incident 16 years ago at Oregon State, leading to weeks of soul searching there. In addition, there are accusations of sexual predation emerging at Florida State, Vanderbilt, Columbia, Montana, Hobart, and dozens of other campuses across the country. Today, our panelists will discuss whether colleges are doing enough on campus to prevent or combat sexual assault. Jessica Amo is the director of the Women's Resource Center at Portland State University where she oversees all sexual violence prevention and response program operations, including supervising the WRC Interpersonal Violence Advocate, coordinating IPV-related event planning, and serving on university and community task forces. She is also co-chair of the Subcommittee on Campus Assault of the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force. Ronnie Sue is the co-associate director of bias prevention and education at Oregon State University's Office of Equity and Inclusion, where she provides leadership and direction for creating and maintaining a university climate of respect. She also leads the design and implementation of the university's coordinated bias prevention and education programs and initiatives, including efforts pursuant to Title IX as it pertains to sexual harassment and sexual violence. Brenda Tracy is a nurse and activist. She went public with her story about being gang raped 16 years ago at Oregon State University. And moderating today's program is Jackie Sandmeyer. 
Jackie is with the Oregon Attorney General's Sexual Assault Task Force. She has worked with survivors and has focused on college campuses, communities of color, and the LGBTQI community with an emphasis on transgender education for sexual assault nurse examiners and advocates. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for um, having us here this afternoon. The opportunity to have this conversation, which um, as many of you know, is both timely and at such high regard for all of us to have these types of conversations about our community. We really appreciate the time to um, have this moment with you all. So before we go ahead and begin with the questions for the panelists today, um, I think what would really be great for the audience and for all of us is if we sort of talked about how this conversation of campus sexual assault is at the point where it is now where we're having these national conversations. Um, so I guess to start off, it would be nice to know that with Title IX passing in 1972, which seems so long ago now, um, and with sexual violence not a new issue, and especially on the campus realm, what has brought us here to where we're just now having these conversations in 2015? Well, I'll go. <laughs> um, I think that we're in crisis. I think that's what's finally brought this conversation up now is that we're in crisis. The number is one in five women on college campus will experience some sort of sexual violence. And that is an epidemic to me. And there are, they say most campus sexual assaults are not even reported. So who really knows what that number truly is because women, especially on campuses, are not reporting. So I think we're just in crisis and we finally have to deal with it. We can't turn our, our heads anymore and pretend like it's not going on. I, I guess I would agree with Brenda that um, we're in crisis, but I think that we as a nation have been in crisis for a very long time. And although, yes, absolutely, sexual assault is a problem on college campuses, but it's not just a problem on college campuses. It's really a national societal issue. And the fact that it has finally made it to national attention, I think, is, um, is progress. And I think we're seeing some really rapid movement forward and, and bringing the conversation to the level where it really needs to be so that we can have an impact on those numbers. Great, thank you. So as far as higher education went, um, we now see that President Obama has brought together a task force for campus sexual assault um, we've also seen in the news that the Office of Civil Rights has now published multiple investigations lists with um, different higher education institutions on that list. Um, and we also hear sometimes of people referencing something called the Dear Colleague Letter. So can you maybe give us an idea of what that timeline looked like and um, sort of what urged really both on a national and statewide level for these resources to be drawn to different campuses? Your colleague later came out in 2011, right? April 2011, President Obama and Joe Biden put it forward. And I think that there was a moment for schools to really re start reflecting on what is it that we're doing and what are the gaps on our campuses that need to be imminently addressed. Yeah, and I, I guess I would say that really the dear colleague letter was a heads up to college campuses that there was going to be some really increased scrutiny relative to the requirements that really began in 1972. So obviously we've seen that now that this is a national conversation, we're seeing more and more survivors come forward with their stories. So maybe with you, Ronnie, can you maybe explain to us about examples of the different type of reports that you see on campuses and sort of what the process looks like for those students who come forward? Well, we see a lot of 
a, a wide variety of reports that come forward. We see young folks who have been um, assaulted at parties, sometimes facilitated by alcohol or other drugs. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's somebody that they know, um, sometimes well and, and not so well. Um, we also see survivors come forward who have had experiences, not necessarily on college campuses, but find that it's impacting their academic pursuits, so we provide support for them. Uh, so we see really a wide variety of folks coming forward. Some, sometimes folks come forward right away, sometimes they wait a while, it really kind of depends on, um, really depends on them and kind of the context of their situation. Um, in any case, what we do is immediately provide support to that, that student. So I'm speaking particularly of students on college campuses. Um, and that can be a variety of things. Uh, our college campus and most do have counseling and psychological services. We have sexual assault support services on campus. So we do a lot of referrals. We work with very closely on our college campus with Oregon State Police. So we always provide the survivor, <coughs> excuse me, with all their options for reporting. Um, there's medical attention that's available both on our campus and in our community. And what we really try and do is provide that survivor um, a variety of options that he or she really has an opportunity to decide how they would like to proceed. Um, some of the other options we have are moving, uh, if they live on campus, maybe we move their rooms. Um, it really it, it kind of depends. And then, of course, we also have the on-campus um, adjudication process that they have an option to pursue if they wish as well. So one thing that you bring up, and I think we're hearing it a lot of survivors' story, is this delay of time between when violence occurs and when a survivor feels comfortable coming forward. Could we maybe get an idea of what creates that delay or why people are waiting to come forward for so long? Yeah, I was just looking at a report from the Department of Justice this morning that talked about the way that only 20% of reports are, re are reported to the police at all, and an equally small number are reported to service providers like me. So students are much more likely to tell their friends than they are to tell a professional in my position. Um, and I've heard all kinds of reasons identified by students about why they are hesitant to come forward or uh, they decide not to. So I've heard students just do a lot of self-blaming and feeling like this is something that they've done and that they're very afraid that people will not believe them um, or that they will share that judgment. Um, I've had a student say to me, you know, not having my friends believe me when I told them that I was assaulted was actually worse than the assault itself. And that response informed all of her decisions about deciding not to go forward to other service providers. Um, I've seen a lot of students who are just afraid of retaliation, either social or um, logistical, right? So if people are having to share class space or work on campus, and the person that harmed them um, is in those spaces, they're afraid of what that will look like. And students also just often tell me they don't want to make a big deal and they are really concerned about what will happen after they put themselves in the public eye, right? So I've had a student say, you know, I just really don't wanna be that, quote, that girl that everybody talks about after they make a report. Um, and so there's just a lot of, I think that students watch how we talk about survivors and they're really concerned that that blame is going to be directed at them. Yeah, that's all true. <laughs> um, as a survivor, I, I did come forward. I did report to the university. I did get a rape kit. I did report to the police. And <clears throat> I think everything that I feared came true. I had family and friends that did not believe me or turned on me, did not want to be a part of the process. I had uh, two death threats by phone towards myself and my small children. I was in the media. I was, uh, yeah, I was that girl. Um, one of my attackers had um, violated parole by being in Oregon on an armed robbery charge. He was gang affiliated, so I was worried about retaliation. Um, I was ashamed, I was embarrassed. It was all public, and yeah, everyone chooses sides. 
And um, not only that, but after the event, I was suicidal. So everything that I was afraid of by coming forward really did happen. And it caused me to eventually, after two weeks of being in I'm gonna report mode, I retreated back to a life of shame and silence and dropped the charges and tried to just pretend like it never happened. And I suffered for 16 years doing that until I recently just came forward. So these concerns that these victims have are absolutely valid. And we have to shift the culture so that these fears are no longer valid and that they can feel safe coming forward, so. So these concerns of fear of retaliation and fear of the process, I guess my question would be what can be done or what is being done both on an institutional or statewide level on different campuses, even legislatively, to make spaces where survivors feel more comfortable coming forward? So I can talk a little bit about what's happening on my campus. Um, and I think really the fact that the conversation has elevated to a national level is um, like I said earlier, really a positive aspect in, the, in and of itself. Um, on college campuses, on my college campus, we are, um, we have uh, participated in the It's On Us campaign, which is a, it's really a nationwide awareness raising campaign. Um, we have a variety, we've had a variety of events related to that, conversations, open conversations about sexual assault and sexual violence on campus. We've had uh, conversations around consent. There's a lot of messaging just to bring the conversation forward where in the past really sexual violence has been something to be whispered about and not talked about. So I think that's really a benefit. Um, I think that what, what, well, other things that we're doing <clears throat> on our campus is that we're just about to open an advocacy center so that we have a place on campus where folks who are assaulted can go and find confidential support and help through the process and help finding the resources that are available and that the survivor really wants to choose. We have a variety of other resources on campus. Um, we have the sexual assault support services on campus, which is designed to work directly with survivors. Um, our relationship with Oregon State Police and the training that they've had on our campus makes it a little bit um, a, a little bit softer, I think, for some survivors to report to to law enforcement where it's not been so easy in the past. Um, uh, coming up in April very soon is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and we have a variety of uh, events planned, videos, things that. Um, really bring to the, the focus all the variety of elements that really create the, the really the, the culture of violence that, um, that perpetuates sexual violence on campuses across the, across the state. We have also recently, in the last year, um, from legislative guidance, changed our process to make it a more survivor friendly so that it's a really one policy, one process for survivors to come forward. So there's really a variety of things that OSU is doing right now and that I'm seeing really across the nation. People are making a lot of changes and, and providing a lot of education and uh, awareness raising all over campuses. And I think that there's, um two things that we need to do simultaneously. So like you're describing, Ronnie Sue, we need to have really strong response systems and then we need to have complementary prevention work, like Brenda was saying, to shift the culture, right? So on the response side, I think we're having a lot of conversations about um, how, having, how critical it is to have a student-driven, survivor-driven process so that students have access to confidential support services and can make thoughtful, informed decisions about how they want to move forward. And that actually increases reporting, right? So actually not forcing people to report is more likely to connect them to resources. So earlier this week we were in Salem and I listened to the Title IX officer from Southern Oregon University talk about how in 2011 she had 13 campus reports. And then when they instituted a policy of ensuring that all students have access to a confidential advisor, 
who was not obligated to report to anybody else on campus. In 2014, they had 50 reports, right? So I think that there's ways that we can increase um, students' options by giving them access to services. And then on the prevention side, students aren't going to report if they're not getting a clear message that they're going to be believed and that this is unacceptable, right? And if we, can we be working upstream so that we are, people are coming into universities with a clear idea that students have a right to safely access their education and sexual violence impedes that access. I think one of the other things that's necessary for college campuses is to help folks really understand exactly what sexual violence is and what consent really is. I think that many students come to college campuses without a real clear idea of consent and what that really means and sexual violence and also the impact that alcohol and drugs have on creating an environment where sexual violence occurs. One of the other things that Oregon State University is doing is providing um, alcohol and sexual violence training prior to students coming to campus. So it's an online program that we are providing that then we reinforce with other messaging and programming on campus so that when we get to, when they get to campus they have an idea of um, really the basics of you know what is sexual violence, what is consent, how does alcohol impact, how can I help a friend um, avoid those sorts of situations, bystander intervention is, is really what that's called, and then they come to campus and they hear more messaging and they hear conversations about it, um, and I think that's another element of prevention as well. Um, I'd like to see men getting involved. That would be my big thing. I think that most rapes are... Most rapes and most sexual violence is carried out by men against women, other men, and children. Um, it's over 90%, I don't know the exact percent, but women are doing a great job of advocating for ourselves, rallying, um, survivors coming forward, sharing their stories, and it's kind of, from my perspective, it seems like it's a women's issue, and it's not necessarily a women's issue, it's also a men's issue. Sexual violence is a human issue, and I would like to see more men stepping up, holding each other accountable, more education on campuses for, for men, fraternities, athletes, groups of men, um, start shifting that change. Um, and I think you'll see a lot more happen too. So if you have a good prevention and you have good response and everything, then you have the whole package. Because if we're just responding, that's great but let's get to the root of the issue and we, we have to get our male leadership involved, coaches, the, the presidents. It, it's gotta be a trickle down effect from male leaders. It's gotta trickle down into the younger men, the athletes. We have to start, we have to start getting that population involved. Well, before we sort of switch this conversation with, to prevention, which it's been great to hear you all bring up because I think a lot of the times we focus so much on response that we just have little knowledge on what's happening around prevention. Um, you all brought up the idea of reporting and reporting numbers, and I think many people listening may be parents of pers prospective students or might be future students themselves. So where can somebody find these numbers about reports happening on their campuses, and what should somebody get from the understanding of seeing high numbers on a campus? What should be the takeaway from that person looking up those numbers? So the Clary Act requires that all universities publicly make available the incidents of reporting. And so every campus should have a link. It, on my campus, it's a campus public safety and it's the annual crime and fire report and it's publicly available on the front page of the website. Um, I also think that people should just be asking from the minute that they are interviewing schools and that you actually want to hear high numbers. So um, I think that every school should, when you're visiting the admissions person, whoever's taking on your tour, you should ask that student, what does your campus do about sexual assault? And if somebody says to you, we don't have that problem here, then you should never let anyone in your family enroll there, <laughs> and you should not intend. Because sexual assault is not specific to any campuses, and sometimes I think there's been a focus on one campus more than others, or we've singled campuses out, but this is actually a collective problem and a cultural problem. 
So the, what I'm interested in hearing, and when my cousins were applying for college, I, I asked this, they didn't let me come with them to too many <laughs> campuses. <laughs> But I would ask, so what does what, what is, um, your campus do about sexual assault? And if the person who we were talking to could say, my university has a really strong policy, here's the website. We have a policy around effective consent, affirmative consent in our code of conduct. I was trained on this issue as student staff, and if you have any questions, I know how to find the answer to them. And we have a really solid prevention program. And you're gonna get information about that program before orientation, you're gonna see it show up in your inbox during orientation, and then you're gonna hear from us afterwards too. And what other questions do you have? That's what I think that folks should be hearing. Thank you for that, Jessica. I'm sure to many it seems alerting to hear that parents and students should be seeking out colleges with high reporting numbers, so thank you for that explanation. Um, so many of you have talked about sort of these overlaying layers of response and prevention and how a lot of it, it sounds like for many of you, is about teaching skills and about awareness and education building. So what can be done around prevention? I mean, we know that students don't come just to college without any other involvement in other education. Is there work being done for more comprehensive prevention even before students hit college? Well, absolutely. Like I said before, I think there's a lot of things that, that um, college campuses can do really from the very beginning and even before they get to camp, before students come to campus, I think providing um, information around sexual assault like OSU is doing related to um, awareness raising, prevention, so that when folks get to campus, they have an understanding of the policies, practices, really basic information that folks often come to campus without understanding. What we know is that um, folks come to campus, uh, oftentimes it's the first time they're away from their families, um, kind of things open up, uh, and to provide some, st uh, some structure, I think, around helping them understand what it means to be a community member on a college campus related not only to sexual assault and sexual violence, but alcohol and drug use, what it means to be a member of an academic community and those expectations. And so I think that um, the message needs to be consistent and clear um, along with education, and to really invite folks to that conversation. I think throwing information out at, at folks, that, that works a little bit, but then people kind of tune out. So I think inviting people to get involved and to those conversations I think is really important. One of the things that's happening on the OSU campus this year is that fraternity and sorority life, um, the, the Greek system has partnered with our sexual assault support services in working on programming for sexual assault awareness month and and we are expecting really thousands of people of on the campus to come and participate and take back the night next month so i think really inviting folks into the conversation helping them understand what they can do to prevent violence what they can do to um, make the community a, a, a safer place for everyone to be, I think is an important piece of the prevention. Great, thank you. Um, I think one question that's come up in national conversations, especially when schools are sort of being highlighted um, by the Office of Civil Rights and the more survivors have come forward, is this question of transparency. Um, how do you all think that that question of transparency and how campuses handle sexual assaults have changed? And what does coordination look like? Do you partner with people in the community, law enforcement, advocates? Sort of what does that collaboration look like if it does exist? It's key, collaboration is key to offering survivors a full range of options. So I think transparency is a really core fundamental principle and that students should be asking what their universities are doing as well as faculty and staff, right? It should be a, a collective conversation. And um, our community partners are the ones that are serving our students also, right? And often hold the expertise um, in the arena. You know, sexual assault is not a topic that's required in traditional student affairs training. It's not something that most of us are going to come into unless we've 
perceived we've really um, ended up in this profession or have ended up in a training. So I think that having partnerships with our campus part, our off-campus community partners who hold that expertise is really critical and seeking that feedback on how can we be continually improving what we're doing. So is Ronnie and Jessica give us an idea into the window of what this campus response looks like. Do you have any input, Brenda, about what would have helped you 16 years ago? What do you hope changes now? Well, my case is, I think there were things in place at the time that just were not offered to me at the time. So um, it's hard for me to think back of what could have helped me. I think part of just the people doing their job that they were supposed to do at the time would have helped. But um, for today, I think that one thing that's really important that we're working on the legislation right, legislation right now is um, confidential reporting. The student can come to someone on staff at the university or someone at a, a domestic violence sexual assault center or something like that and make a confidential report about an assault and then be given the information this is what's gonna happen, this is what's expected, you know, and give them an idea of what they're looking at and they can make a decision. For me, I wasn't offered that, so I was unable to make an informed decision about my case. So, you know, 16, later, 16 years later, then I find out that I really did have a case and I could have moved forward and I could have prosecuted and um, there's a lot of pain around that issue, so I think informing the students of what their options are is very important, but doing it in a confidential setting, because the one thing you, the one thing I've spent 16 years trying to do is make sure that people know that I was not gang raped. And I've only even been able to say the word gang rape over the last few months, because I felt like it was so shameful and so awful. Um, I could maybe say sexual assault, because maybe that's not, Exactly, <laughs> like people can handle that word a little bit better than gang rape, um, but it's it's an awful it's an awful thing that happens to you, and you just don't want people to know about it. So you need to feel like you're privately speaking to someone that is not going to tell everyone or use it against you, because um, if you're not safe and you don't feel like you have any control, then it's disastrous in the long in the long run. So we've seen you speak publicly quite a bit, including today about your experience and sort of your progress from experiencing victimization to becoming a survivor. And now truly I think many of us would acknowledge you as an activist in the movement. Um, so how has that progress been for you? How has becoming an activist and working um, for some of these changes empowered you to help tell your story? It's been an amazing experience really. Um, I didn't ever really have it set in my mind that I was going to do this. I think I eventually had just tried to run from it, dissociate from it, hide it, pretend like it didn't exist. Um, that eventually, you know, when you try to bury something alive, it will come screaming back at you from the grave. And I think that's what happened to me. I think that I finally was just faced with the monster of my gang rape, like it was just staring me in the face like you're gonna deal with me or you're gonna die is pretty much what I came to. And I didn't wanna die, I wanted to live. I had been walking around for 16 years, dead inside, trying to prove my worthiness in this world, trying to get as much education as possible, trying to be the best person I could to try to prove to people that I was not damaged, that I was not garbage, that I was worthy to walk this planet with everyone else. And it finally just came to a point where I had to speak my truth. I just had to say, this is who I am. This is what's happened to me and I'm not the only one. And there are so many of us that suffer in silence. And for the women who, and the men who can't speak 
I'd like to try to speak for them. And it's been a difficult journey. It's hard for me to sit up here and cry in front of you and tell you what's happened to me, but it's important. And I want you all to understand how important it is. And I want you all to fight for all of the victims that are out there because there are many, many, many of us. And quite honestly, I am some days amazed that the fact that I'm even sitting here in front of you in the condition that I am, because I probably shouldn't be. Many women and many men don't make it. They end up incarcerated, drug addicted, alcohol addicted, suicide, depression, PTSD, eating disorders. There are so many hurting people in the world and many times I look at them and I wonder if they've been a victim of some sort of sexual violence as children or adults. And I would say a lot of them probably have been and that saddens me. So I'm glad we're talking about it. And uh, at this point, I don't think I would change any of it. I think I have an opportunity to do some great things and uh, I'm just gonna keep pushing forward. Thank you, Brenda, for telling your story. It really has, I, I know for all of us practitioners, it's been more than heartening to listen to and the change that you've brought about in so many survivors who have also heard your story. Um, one thing that I appreciate in what I heard you say just now and I've heard you say before is that um, you feel like you had to tell your truth. And I know a lot of survivors feel the same way. So I guess the question is, why is it that as a community, even larger than campuses, but really as a nation, why is it that we don't start by believing when somebody comes forward after being victimized? I think any time that we can treat this as an individual problem and look at sort of what is wrong with this person, that something happened to them, then it removes our responsibility to view this as a collective and community issue. Yeah, and I. I think too that um, sometimes these things are so horrible that we don't want to believe them. Um, I've gone through that with my own case. Like I know that I was gang raped by four men. I know that they high fived and laughed, you know, and egged each other on to rape and sodomize me. I know that a flashlight was used. I know that an alcohol bottle was used on me. Um, and it's so horrific that you don't want to believe that it's happening. You don't want to believe that these kinds of things can happen to people that you know in your, own, in your community, next door. You don't want to believe it. And so it's easier to say, eh, she's probably lying about that. That can't be true. You know, that can't be my son's friend that did that. Or that can't be the girl that I know next door. What, what, did, the, what did she do to maybe, you know, bring that on? And... Um, I think that's some of what it is. You just don't want to believe that it can happen. I've done that myself, <laughs> to myself. <laughs> so. And as we've been talking about prevention, I think there's some opportunity to look at how it is that we talk about gender, how we look, talk about masculinity, and are we setting up really rigid ideas of masculinity and how that plays out in forms of sexualized violence and normalization of sexual violence. And we have opportunities to change the way that we're talking about that with um, children starting at a young age. So ideally, people would be arriving at college with a completely different mindset. So one thing that's interesting about that education and sort of about the assaults that are happening is that it sounds like most assaults that individuals are experiencing are by known perpetrators. So that sort of contradicts what we've thought for years about educating women and educating um, our young people about sort of the dangers of unknown individuals. How does this change prevention education? How does this change the messaging on campuses? It's such a good point. People ask me all the time uh, when I'm offering the next self-defense workshop, um, which is important, right? Self-defense is important. We do offer it and I encourage students to access self-defense. 
But um, I also have gotten a lot of feedback that when that is the first message and the primary message, it sends this message that all you need to do is accumulate a set number of skills and then you will be protected from having this happen to you. And if this happens to you, it's because you didn't have the right skills, right? And we could be really, I think that there's been an opportunity to look at that and a shift to be saying, we actually wanna be um, examining the core cont contribution. Like what is it that we are saying to people that is um, allowing this to be a normal, a normal part of people's expectations, right? So can we be talking to, instead of shifting all of, putting all of the responsibility on, um, people to protect themselves, could we be saying, we actually just think that nobody should be perpetrating, and here's how we're going to be doing that. Yeah, I think what you said is extremely important, because I know for me, um, you know, we teach women how to protect themselves, and so, you know, I have a list in my head of the hundred things I should do. You know, don't drink from an open container. Don't leave your drink sitting around. Uh, carry your keys a certain way. Don't go to class at night. You know, all this stuff. And um, then when you get raped, you automatically go back to that list of the hundred things that I should have done to protect myself. I go through each one. I figure out which one I did wrong, and then I blame myself. And so what I've done is then I've just shifted all the blame to myself and society has shifted that blame to myself too because they've gone through their own checklist of what I did wrong and nothing is about the perpetrator anymore and that's, um, that's crazy. That doesn't make any sense at all. I didn't, you know, I went to an apartment with people I knew. I never drank, but I thought I was safe to have one drink because I was with friends. Um, I was drugged, but then I blamed myself for being drugged because I drank from that cup, which doesn't make any sense, but I blame myself saying, oh, I drank, so it's my fault. Oh, I got raped because I went there. I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have known. I should have known better than to go to a, a house where my friends are. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And victims do that. We do this crazy making thing where we blame. So um, we have to get rid of that list for people of, you know, what you should do to protect yourself. I mean, I, there's a balance, obviously, but um, yeah, these are people we know. And that's what makes it even more confusing and more traumatic is that I know that person. Wh what just happened? Why would that happen? Like, what did I do to, to make that happen? And that's not what it's about. It's about what did, what's what going on with that person that they would do that? Not the victim. I have done a lot of new um, innovation around consent trainings and how are we talking about consent? And it seems like this is the conversation that needs to be happening. So I do find that when I'm asking, when I'm speaking to students and I ask how many students, and I can do it here, how many of you were all were trained to carry your keys, watch your drink, and check under the car when you parked it, right? And I'm making some assumptions, but to me it looks like a lot of folks who are women answer that question, right? How many men would say that they received, received that training? And I'm not seeing any hands. Right. So, I, and how many people went to college with any kind of training on consent? And I'm not seeing any hands. And so this is consistent with what I find when I'm speaking with students. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to be sending people to university with training on consent and then continuing to revisit that while people are on campus. Great, thank you. Um, one fluid vein throughout all of your conversations has really been this idea of change the changes that you've seen around consent, around education, um, the changes that have allowed survivors to come forward and tell their stories. And I think many of the listeners have seen that change as well. I mean, just this year, for the first time, a president interrupted the commercials during a Super Bowl to do a public service announcement about violence in our country. So what can we be hopeful about? What changes that have come that after years, after Title IX going into practice in 1972, what changes have you all seen that have come about from us finally having these national conversations? Well, so I have two, two thoughts about that. One is that I've seen it very locally on my college campus. Um, the mechanisms that we've put in place, the expanded capacity that OSU has invested in, in terms of providing education, awareness raising, um, 
response mechanisms. I think I've already seen that sort of change, but I also think it's really heartening to see this conversation rise to the national level. Um, I think as Jessica was talking about, you know, we get students that come to our campus that really don't understand the idea of consent. And, and my hope sort of for the future really is that we continue those conversations on a national level, but that folks also realize that the conversations have to start much earlier than even high school. It's really about how we teach children to interact with one another and what boundaries are um, and what you know ideas of masculinity and gender and those gender roles and and how we talk about that to one another so by the time they get to college campus they have an understanding really of um, what consent really means and and the incidence then of sexual assault will be reduced and I think some of the legislative requirements have created the opportunity to shift this from a voluntary set of steps that we can take, you know, like Brenda was saying, this is a women's issue or is this is something that a small group of activists care about, to this is an institutional obligation. Um, and I think that that's really ch shifted the conversation and supported us in having conversations about our resources, where are we allocating our resources on campus, um, and how can we take steps to being really public about our commitment to talk about this difficult issue rather than um, being concerned about how it will negatively affect public perception. And so I've noticed, I'm just excited to be having this conversation, for example, um, and I feel like I'm invited to the table all the time on my campus and that there's lots of really positive and constructive conversations because of that support. So this really is a complex conversation to have. And I know that you all are working within framework of multiple federal laws, multiple state laws. And Jessica, you bring up sort of resources as well. What resources do schools have to work with? And so I guess the question is, is taking such a complex issue, what do you all hope that from this larger issue of policies and procedures and different statutes happening, just down to the conversation of sexual violence and how that affects our communities, what do you hope that everybody takes away from this today? And what you hope sort of stays in people's minds when it comes to this topic as they go home to continue these topics and continue to have these topics in their communities? Well, I think that each person has an obligation as a community member to do their part. And your part might just be educating your young children on how to treat each other respectfully. Um, you may have college age kids. I mean, you don't have to be a survivor of rape to be an activist. You don't have to be um, a lawyer or part of the sexual assault response team or anything. Everybody can do their part in educating, holding each other accountable. You know, men, if you hear one of your friends saying something really derogatory or weird, just be like, oh, yeah, no, that's not cool. You know, just it could be anything really small, but little things will create a large shift culturally, and eventually we will get a handle on this, and hopefully um, it'll just become a thing of like, no, that's not okay. You know, we've seen shifts like that in other areas. So I know it can happen with this issue also. And I just wanna echo what Brenda said. It's really, we all have an, a responsibility to bring the conversation to the table and to invite others into that conversation to educate ourselves and to you know educate one another in whatever realm we all have because that's really how it how change happens is really at the ground level that all of us having these conversations, bringing others to the conversation, um, educating one another about myths um, really is where the change begins and, and the change gets maintained there as well. I guess I would say two things. Uh, one is really committing to um, Brenda's message about shifting expectations. So in, in, we've been in this cultural place of assuming we're gonna go to college, send somebody to college, they're gonna get their sexual assault, they're gonna get their degree, they're gonna go out into the world. And if we could shift that expectation too, that's completely unacceptable. 
expectation of a university education, and we want our students to have safe access to their education. That would be number one. And number two, what are the resources that we're willing to, al to allocate? And so as we're having conversations about new pieces of legislation and opportunities for, um, for growing services, our, our resources attach, knowing that there's lots of really committed people on our campus, and often campuses are not able to fully address issues, not because they don't want to, but because they don't have the resources to do so, and could we be advocating for a change in that? Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for broadening really this window for us into this topic. Um, I think at this time we're gonna open up for questions from the larger audience and I see that um, Congressman or Congresswoman Bonamici is at the microphone, so please go ahead. Thank you so much, Suzanne Bonamici, City Club member. I wanna start by thanking uh, the City Club of Portland and all of the panelists for having this incredibly important conversation today. I can assure you that there are many places around the country and even around Oregon where we wouldn't be having such a, uh, an open and important conversation. So thank you, thank you for being here. As a member of the House Education and Workforce Committee, we talk a lot about school safety and if we want students to do well in school, whether it be uh, K-12 or college university, we need to have safe campuses. That's all part of doing well in education. So uh, I know it was mentioned earlier uh, that uh, I have recently sent a letter to the uh, Secretary um, and to the Department of Education uh, about what we discovered was a, uh, what appears to be a loophole in the federal laws that protect education records. Uh, there is a, some, a circumstance under which uh, records at a campus office where uh, a survivor may seek uh, advice and medical treatment that that may be treated as an education record, which does not have the same breadth of protection as a health record. So Senator Wyden sent a letter as well. We're waiting for a response for the Department of Education because if there's a loophole there, we need to close that loophole. We wanna make sure that uh, anyone on campus feels safe going to campus uh, to get uh, that, in, that, that help, that advice, that, that treatment. Um, so we're, we're gonna be working on that. Uh, there's also legislation that I'm co-sponsoring uh, to, to address this issue, the Campus uh, Safety and Accountability Act. Um, and what I encourage all of you to do is to, uh, to contact your member of Congress, whether it be me or uh, our other great uh, members here in Oregon, or importantly, if you have friends and family around the country, make sure that uh, they're contacting uh, their representative uh, about the importance of this issue so that we can uh, really bring to the attention of the committee and the Congress to, and get some legislation passed. Um, at the beginning, someone mentioned that we are in crisis. Uh, I don't know if we will, if we know or will ever know if we've always had a crisis and now we're aware of it, but regardless, we have to do something about this. I know the state legislature is considering um, a bill as well. So uh, just a couple of things. You answered many of my questions in your excellent presentation, uh, but when we talk about prevention, how, how can we do that? There's an, obviously, we can't legislate everything, but are there programs that we, where we start early uh, with, with students in K-12, and then also, can you talk a little bit more about the collaboration? I know you mentioned the Southern Oregon example where campuses are coordinating with law enforcement, with individuals, with uh, partnerships. Can you explain a little bit more about that uh, coordination so that people can get the message about what is working? Thank you again for the excellent discussion. I think Jackie could help us with that question. Um, well, I think the prevention question first to sort of answer, um, I think now is really the first time we've started to reflect on this conversation of, like Ronnie said, how do we give students the skills of consent and healthy boundaries and how to navigate consent before they get to our college campuses? Um, and is a college campus really the place to start having those conversations? Um, and Oregon's in a very unique position where um, we did pass the Healthy Teen Relationship Act here in Oregon. And from my position of being sort of a statewide coordinator for a lot of um, campus practitioners, 
it's been a breath of fresh air to hear a lot of um, individuals on different campuses talking about um, how do we start conversations with those who are doing consent and um, sex education in K through 12, and how do we extend those conversations on the college campuses. And there are some colleges out there who are starting to reach out um, to their K through 12 prevention practitioners and starting to have conversations of what ways can there be more overlap and what ways can we help build upon students' skills so that by the time they come to college um, that they have sort of already a skill base for college practitioners to help build on from that. Um, the question of law enforcement I think is a great one. Um, and Southern Oregon University really is a great model and I applaud the work that they do there. And I think the question for a while has been sort of what does that collaboration look like? And beyond even higher education in the world of sexual violence, we've asked ourselves a lot of time, what does that collaboration between disciplines look like? When we know that a survivor of violence is coming in contact with advocates, with law enforcement, with sexual assault nurse examiners, with counselors, what's the best way that all of our disciplines can come together and really collaborate on policies and survivor-centered, trauma-centered um, procedures? And one thing has been the You Have Options program in Ashland, Oregon that um, Southern works very closely with that was started by Detective Carrie Hole. And it really did come back to this idea that, um, and Brenda did a great job of explaining, the idea that survivors need time and survivors need privacy. And what survivors need the most is a process that they can drive, a process that they can move forward on their own grounds and that they can sort of get informed of their options and then make informed decisions after that. And really all of our jobs here, um, including Ronnie and Jessica, our jobs are never to um, tell a survivor what to do, but really our job is to inform and train staff who are the most informed to then inform survivors of their options. Um, and at that point, empower survivors to make their own decisions. Wynn Wakala, City Club member, and also executive director for FAST, which stands for Fight Against Sex Trafficking. This coming Monday night, City Club is having a meeting just on what we're doing. You're talking, the problem is the demand side. If men weren't geared somehow towards sexual violence, we wouldn't have a problem. It's the same thing with sex trafficking. So our meeting Monday night first talks about misogyny, which is how men look at women, and then also about the addictive side of pornography. They found that 65% or 56% of time spent on the computer is looking at pornography. And we've noticed an uptick in sex trafficking because of that. And I wondered if you also had noticed that um, for sex on sexual violence, especially on campuses. And I do want to say, men, we need you to stand up. You are the ones that can change this. We women can get as involved as we want, but if the attitude by men does not change, nothing's gonna get better. I'll say that we have had uh, lots of good conversations about how media is used as a tool of abuse and perpetration. So we recently added sexual exploitation to our student code of conduct um, just because of seeing the way that re revenge porn was working and the way that um, a lot of the social media sites are actually used by folks to perpetrate. And so I think it's a, a good reminder for us to be staying attuned to all of the different forms of violence that, um, that show up and how we need to be intervening in multiple ways. Mary Moeller, City Club member and also work at Portland State University in government relations. I wanna thank you all, you all were amazing today. It was really refreshing to have this conversation out loud. Um, I have a question about prevention and education and I don't know if anyone else has seen like these YouTube videos where they do bystander education. They use it a lot with bullying. Um, can you, one, explain what bystander education is, and two, what is going on on campuses to do more of that education? Bystander education is um, looking at the ways that everybody has an opportunity to intervene, as Brenda was saying, 
So um, there are actually a, a lot of great YouTube videos out there and a lot of great training programs that set up scenarios and offer students the opportunity to practice intervening. So on my campus, we have a sexual assault education theater capstone where the students actually write scenarios and then perform them in other classes and students in the audience step up and practice interrupting um, violations of consent that are playing out theatrically. And it's the idea of practicing in a low stakes environment, uh, rehearsing for life is the phrase. The University of Oregon has a really strong program that focuses on theater-based bystander intervention. Um, and we are, it's something that we are definitely interested in growing, Mary, right, thanks. Um, and then just in addition is that um, July of this year of 2015, the SAVE Act, which was an amendment to the original Violence Against Women Act, will go into effect and it'll be the first federal, um, really the first federal language that will give the task to higher education institutions of not just response, but for the first time prevention and education awareness as well, which I think is a huge step in the right direction. Ted Kay, City Club member. I'm intrigued by the language you're using. You're calling those who have been sexually assault assaulted survivors. This term appears to have substituted for the word victim. A quick online search shows this is a relatively recent change. I've seen some compelling discussion about the preference for the word survivor to the word victim. Have any of you considered this preference? And can you share your thoughts on why you prefer survivor to victim? Well, I prefer whatever term people choose for themselves, actually. So I try to default to that. But it is something that changes over disciplines, like Jackie was saying. So in law enforcement, we're trained around crime victim language. Um, I was brought up in advocacy land, and basically um, anybody who is alive after being assaulted is a survivor. Right. And then there's other folks that raise concerns that that language actually minimizes the experiences of trauma. And there's some folks that really want to advocate to kind of reclaim the word victim. It's just let's acknowledge the trauma that has occurred and not make it seem like a phase that you have to get over. So it's a really rich conversation. I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, I feel like it's a state of mind. I spent 16 years after my rape being a victim and I bought into the self-loathing, the self-hatred, the whole deal. Um, and then I shifted into Survivor, where I'm able to own that experience, that it's made me who I am today, and take the good from it. And so for me, it's kind of a state of mind, and it's a process. You move from victim into Survivor. Thank you. We have run out of time. Uh, for further questions, and we'll have to stop for the day. As we close, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to Congresswoman Bonamici, Jackie Sandmeyer, Jessica Amo, Ronnie Sue, and Brenda Tracy. Thank you. Thank you.